since um, since it's uh, quite a long intro, we probably we'll get going, and, and that, that will mean a lot of people will join us hopefully in the next twenty minutes of introducing Mike. Um, he, he, he like like Mikhail says, he's a, he's a veteran, but his list of accomplishments um, uh, sort of goes beyond what it means to be a, a veteran. It's quite a quite quite a um, quite a CV, if you like, yeah, if you if you know about Mike very much at all. So welcome everyone. Uh, today, uh, Dr. Michael Jackson, uh, as you may know, is going to talk about Bogdanov, uh, pragmatism, and the uniting the systems movement. Um, yeah, uh, the systems at play um, uh, community that we've, we've we've started up has now uh, reached 318 members, and we're across all the continents except for Antarctica, 30 countries, and 95 cities. And we've got more people joining all the time. I'm not sure how many people are on, going to be on the call today. I think we've got around 50 people wanting to join us. Uh, we'll see where that winds up. Um, yeah, that's about it on that slide. Thanks, mate. Systems play. So who are we? Uh, we were a community born of like two main inspirations. Uh, one was the response to the dominant reductionist way of thinking in the world. Not that there's anything wrong with being reductionist, but that needs to be balanced. And the difficulty we, we have, and this is something I think Mike will probably touch on, and understand the deep and vast space of systems thinking and practical ways of applying it. Uh, we turn this into a bit of a, of a passion for ourselves as well, and we're trying to learn together. So Mikhail, myself, and Ali Dad are all just trying to learn as, as we go. Um, we seem to be jumping from, from one thing to the next as we see the next amazing thing in the history of systems thinking and, and uh, obviously of things that are emerging as well. Cool. So about uh, Michael C. Jackson, um, I don't know if I should read all this out. I'll give it a go, Michael. Um, uh, Michael, Michael, what do you prefer? No, no, I think you should you should go very quickly through it. Oh, very good. So um, Mike's the Emeritus Professor at the University of Hull, MD. Um, between 99 and 2011, he was the Dean of Hull University Business School, uh, taking the Triple Crown accreditation. Uh, he's, um, now Editor-in-Chief of the Systems Research Behavioural Science uh, for the last 26 years. There are three pages of this, Mike. <laughs> uh, well, skip it, skip it, skip it then. <laughs> oh, no, I, I, I want to go through a little bit of it, um, if that's okay. It's received many awards and honours, and maybe this is a bit embarrassing for him. Maybe that's yeah, you're only, you're only putting pressure on me. I've got to, uh, I have to, I'll, have to perform, I'll have to perform like some genius after this. It's we, too we early in the morning. No less. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, that's fine. We'll skip on uh, to, to the next slide. Basically, um, he's just, he's, he's an amazing guy. He's got a current uh, publication of, uh, at the moment, which is um, Critical Systems Thinking and Managing Complexity, uh, published in 2019. He's written uh, over 10 books and published over 150 articles as well. I won't carry on much more about, about the speaker, uh, but we do need your help. What we'll do with this is we will make sure that we're recording it and that we go into our YouTube space. If you can, please, if we get 100 subscribers, that means we get to, get to simplify the channel and keep the Systems at Play channel going. Um, if you would like, uh, get your, your phones out and use the QR code if you like and go and uh, subscribe now if you can. We would normally pause here, but I'm keen to get going. We'll just give it a few seconds. Cool. That's probably enough, Mikhail, for people who want to do it. Uh, obviously, all this material will be sent through to all of the attendees as well. Um, so it'd be great to actually to hear from, from people. Maybe you type it in the chat, what city you're calling in from. We'd like to find out where people are, are far flung from, what, what towns and, and cities they're from. Uh, obviously, the recording is being, uh, is being, we're being this is, talk is being recorded and will be made public uh, via YouTube. Uh, we ask you to stay on mute during the presentation and type your questions in the chat. And there'll be a Q&A at the end. Uh, typically, that's how we do it, depending on, on the numbers. Mike, are you okay for people to, to, to ask questions along the way, or would you rather leave those to the end? I'd rather leave those till, the, till I finish. I'll try and finish in half an hour, Dave, so there's plenty of time. For... Cool. Fantastic. Um, great to see a lot of people um, putting in where they're from. Uh, Melbourne, Brisbane, Sydney, Perth, Sheffield, North Carolina. Great to see. Joan. Joan's here. Oh, cool. I can't see the list of people. Uh, welcome everyone from all around the world. Um, we are looking to uh, possibly do a, a, um, uh, some training sessions with um, Marilyn Emery in August as well. And that's likely to be in Canberra. 
Uh, Marilyn doesn't move around too much uh, in her 80s at the moment, so she's asked us to move that to Canberra. So if you're interested, we'll, we'll uh, put some information on that when it's available and post it into the community. Any questions on anything before we begin? No? All right, cool. Over to you, Mike. Okay, hello everybody, and thank you to Mihail, Dave, and Ali Dad for inviting me to spend this uh, hour with you and on this topic of uh, Bogdanov pragmatism and uniting the systems movement. Um, I, th I think systems movement is is doing okay um, uh, as a, a veteran of that movement, as Mihail calls me. Um, I've never seen as the level of interest in systems thinking that I'm seeing now. Uh, and that's extremely uh, gratifying. Uh, people are becoming more and more aware of uh, the need to have something that can help them to deal with the complexity uh, of, of the world. Um, but I think it can do even better uh, if, it, if it unites. Um, I think if it unites, it inevitably becomes more in influential. Uh, people can understand better what, what it's about and what it has to offer. I mean, we claim to have a, an approach in systems thinking that can deal with the VUCA world and the complexity of the world. Um, but if we're disunited ourselves, that's not particularly convincing. Um, so we can become more influential if we succeed in, in, in uniting. Uh, and as I'm going to be saying, I think that's going to require a commitment to a, a philosophy, to find, finding a philosophy that, uh, that we can unite around. Uh, and that'll also enable us to, uh, to talk better with other disciplines. Um, we've got a lot to learn from uh, people in other disciplines, organisation theory, physics, sociology, engineering. Um, and if we know what we're about philosophically, theoretically, uh, then I think we can talk more easily to them. What we have to offer that they don't, for the most part, uh, is practical orientation. Uh, systems thinking is the discipline or the transdiscipline uh, for practice, as far as I'm concerned, and, uh, and we can help translate the ideas of other disciplines uh, into practice through the use of systems ideas. So let me get started. I. I uh, I promised um, Dave and the organizers that I wouldn't be too philosophical in, in this talk, and I, and I won't be. This is the only slide that has any philosophy in it. The rest is orientated to the practical application of these ideas. But it's an attempt to find a unified philosophy of systems thinking that will get us all on the same page uh, and therefore make our movement more influential. Uh, and my, my starting point in thinking about this was really uh, the rediscovery of the work of uh, Alexander Bogdanov. Uh, and Orsan Senel, who's on this call, has played a big part in that. Um, Bogdanov was a, a, a Russian um, re revolutionary, um, but he was the first person to propose a, a unified system science, a unified science of organization, techno technology, he called it. Uh, and this was decades before von Bertalanffy or uh, Wiener uh, came up with general system theory and cybernetics. Uh, and I think that the philosophy underpinning Bogdanov's approach is, is much more sophisticated than anything developed by von Bertalanffy or, or, or Wiener. Uh, so in exploring that philosophy, um, I noted its links to pragmatism, uh, a, a well-established um, philosophy, particularly in the United States. Uh, and I started reading the work of um, uh, Pierce, um, William James, perhaps the best known pragmatist uh, philosopher, uh, uh, and Dewey. They, they were the founding fathers of philosophy of pragmatism in the United States. And I found a huge similarity, many commonalities between their work and that of Bogdanov. So I thought, well, hang on, we're on the we're on the right track here. We're, we're finding a philosophy which can potentially underpin 
systems thinking and the systems approach as a whole. Um, so to introduce the talk, I just want to say, uh, point to the, these four things, uh, which I think can provide us with a unified philosophy for systems thinking and the systems movement. Uh, and in doing so, I've mixed up the ideas of Bogdanov, Pierce, James and Dewey, because they are so similar. Um, so the first of these is something that complexity theorists will have no trouble embracing. It's that reality is an unfolding canvas of different complexes, fluid and ever-changing. That Those are actually Bogdanov's words. Uh, and it exhibits novelty, spontaneity and variety, William James's uh, yeah. words. So it's, its process uh, and its complexity and its fluidity and its novelty and its variety and spontaneity. Uh, a second point stems, uh, follows from that, that you, you can't get universal truths. You can't understand the whole uh, system uh, because it's ever changing. Uh, we're part of it. Uh, we can change it ourselves. We have a role in it. Uh, and so the attempt to pin down and model and capture all aspects of complex systems is, is hopeless. Uh, and acting in the face of uncertainty requires a different strategy. Uh, it requires, in Pierce's words, developing habits of action, which can successfully guide our engagements with the world, which, but which might come crashing down. Uh, and this is true of, of, of physics, where you, you can live under particular paradigms for certain periods of time, maybe the Newtonian paradigm exists for centuries, um, but uh, it's uh, a partial truth um, which can come crashing down, and it did come crashing down. Uh, and the same with many of our habits of action that we use uh, in the social domain. So in developing these habits of action, uh, we need a pluralism of partial truths to explore the world, not, not a universal truth, but partial truths. Uh, and we evaluate them not as mirrors of nature. Uh, this is Dewey. Um, our knowledge is not uh, seeking to be a mirror of nature, to capture, represent some world out there. Uh, but we need to see our concepts and ideas pragmatically as tools for living. Uh, their ways of guiding us in our interactions and our engagements um, with, with the world. And this is a wholly different perspective, seeing us as part of the world, as grappling with it as a human species, and as seeking tools, concepts and ideas which enable us to be successful in the world. So we're not, we're not trying to mirror the world, that's, that's a hopeless concern, hopeless enterprise where we we are seeking to find ways of getting by uh, better uh, in in the world uh, and the fourth point uh, we're part and parcel of the world um, uh, we evolved as part of the world uh, we have a responsibility to improve it James and Dewey say and uh, Dewey has it nicely philosophy needs rescuing from the pointless pursuit of eternal wisdom uh, and making relevant to everyday affairs so that it can help us become uh, intelligent uh, world builders. Uh, those who um, uh, see uh, philosophy as a mirror of nature, as a, an attempt to get at eternal wisdom, uh, are kidding themselves. It's, it's a hopeless enterprise. Uh, philosophy needs to come down to earth and be relevant uh, to everyday affairs so it can help us become intelligent world, world builders. Uh, and it's arguable, and um, I have argued it, that if, if Bogdanov's ideas had been accepted, not suppressed in Russia, it was suppressed by Stalin, then the history of Soviet Russia may have been wholly different. And indeed, it's the case that if Dewey's ideas had been accepted uh, more readily in the United States, then the history of the United States might have been different as well. Uh, it might have got rid of um, its racism, sexism, uh, uh, et cetera, much earlier than it, uh, than it uh, see, see, before it started to address those problems. Okay, so that's a philosophical background, and I'm hoping you're gonna be able to see how this translates into 
uh, the use they make of systems ideas in, in critical systems thinking. So faced with the world of complexity, spontaneity, variety, et cetera, according to Moran, uh, systems philosopher, complexity theorist, French, uh, you can address it, the world in two ways. Uh, you can address it seeing it as a case of restricted complexity. Uh, but this remains very much within uh, the epistemology of traditional science, where you attempt to model the world, uh, model the system you're dealing with as a whole, and explain its complex system behavior. Now, this is pretty good at uh, advancing formalization, modeling techniques, and encouraging interdisciplinary working. Uh, and it's the kind of approach that's adopted in things, in approaches such as general systems theory and agent-based modeling. Uh, and these things have some use. Um, Dave was saying before we got on this chat that reductionism has, still has some use. We're not trying to abandon these things. Uh, we're trying to put them into perspective when they're useful and when they're not useful. Uh, and these are restricted approaches to complexity. The modeling approaches, some system dynamics approaches as well, uh, are useful in many circumstances. But if you see the world as a case of general complexity, uh, as Moran prefers, then we're much more, again, within the philosophy of pragmatism. This approach uh, resists universal truths. Uh, it sees all attempts to model as being partial. Uh, it sees the fundamental problem as being epistemological, cognitive, and paradigmatic. Uh, by which he means that the way we see the world affects the way we act in it and therefore the way the world is, so that we're part of the system that we're seeking to explain, and that makes it all the more difficult. Uh, and it draws attention uh, to the need to somehow navigate, to, to manage complexity, rather than to seek to understand it and to predict and uh, control it. Let me give you an example of COVID-19 and the approach to COVID-19 in the UK. It's arguable that in the early days, uh, COVID-19 in the UK was treated as a case of restricted complexity. Uh, a lot of faith was put in the epide epidemiological models uh, as capable of tracing the course of the pandemic uh, and telling decision makers when and where to act uh, in terms of the decisions they took with, with regard to the pandemic. So there were models and people be regarded them as representing the, the, the epidemic and the course of that disease. I mean, this was nonsense because nobody knew how fast it was transmitting or they, they didn't understand where it was or uh, how it was transmitted. And, and of course, they didn't either take into account the reactions of people to pronouncements about the way that the pandemic would develop nor did they take into account the political realities, uh, the way that politicians needed to respond to the pandemic. And so in the early days, it was treated as a case of restricted complexity. Uh, and they literally believed that they could decide on the basis of models when to introduce things such as face masks and um, isolation uh, and, and so on. Of course, this was, this, was, this was nonsense. It needed to be seen as a case of general complexity uh, where you took whatever drastic action was needed uh, to somehow get to grips with things before you could uh, achieve some greater understanding of it. Somebody put it this way, that if you've got an avalanche coming towards you, you don't try and work out the physics of the situation, uh, you somehow get out of its way, take immediate action, do the things that you seem to work elsewhere uh, and try and tame it uh, that way. So once you introduce, um, if, if you like, the, the weakness of the models, and once you introduce political realities, once you introduce the way that people respond to things, once you introduce inequalities to different parts of the community are being affected by the disease more than others, then it's only, it's proper to treat it as a case of general complexity and regard treating it as a, a, a restricted complexity as, some, as misleading, as I believe it did uh, delay proper responses to COVID-19 in the UK. Okay, now we've argued for uh, against universal truths and for partial truths, 
And how do we get at these partial truths? How, how do we know what partial truths are going to be useful to us uh, uh, and what are not? Uh, and I certainly don't think it's a case of uh, anything goes. Uh, there are some partial truths uh, which over time have proven useful to the human species in making their way in the world in the way that pragmatism uh, demands. These are what um, Pepper, writing in the 1940s, called world hypotheses. Uh, hypotheses which have somehow enabled us uh, to cope with, uh, through evolution, with the development of the natural world and our development within the natural world. And also to enable us to uh, develop as a species using symbols and to uh, operate within a cultural reality, within the social uh, domain. And you can pin down, according to Pepper, various world hypotheses which have been useful uh, in this uh, respect. And Pepper, uh, quoted here, and Lakoff and Johnson were later uh, pragmatist thinkers. Um, Pepper said, I can give you world hypotheses which are the successes of cog cognition, things we've learned to rely upon, uh, useful habits of thinking which lead to good habits of action. And these are the creative discoveries of generations. Lakoff and Johnson say they're experiential gestalts, they're ways of thinking in terms of wholes, thinking systemically, which have proven experiential benefit, experientially beneficial to us as a species. So here they are. Um, this is my interpretation of them looking through the literature uh, of Pepper, Lakoff and Johnson and social theory. The mechanistic worldview, world hypotheses, is extremely useful to us. The organismic worldview is extremely useful to us. Uh, the purposeful systems worldview is extremely useful to us and has proved useful to us. Pepper calls it contextualism. Actually, those first three are highlighted by Russ Aikoff uh, as underpinning a lot of systems th theory. The mechanistic view, the organismic view and the purposeful systems uh, view. Uh, and I agree that they've all proven useful to us, seeing the world in terms of machines, seeing the world in terms of organisms that are evolving and adapting to their environments, seeing the world in terms of stakeholders and people with different aims and objectives, different purposes, different modes of understanding reality. Uh, and I would add to that, to social theory, uh, the need to understand uh, the way that power operates in the society and the way some groups are disadvantaged at the expense of others, missing in Aikoff and in Pepper, and also, of course, environmental concerns. And the unique systemic perspective of interrelationships, uh, different parts of reality intertwined with each other in a way that can lead to uh, uh, unintended consequences. Now, if you operate with these partial truths, uh, according to Pepper, the gears grind, the lights flicker, and the lens is distort, nevertheless, we do seem to get some idea of our world from these vehicles, uh, and without them, we should have to walk pretty much in the dark. So no universal truths, but some very useful, proven, partial truths, world hypotheses, these ones. So how does that relate to systems thinking? Well, I spent... Um, 40 odd years looking at different systems approaches and different systems uh, methodologies uh, and trying to work out um, their strengths and weaknesses uh, in practice, uh, but also in terms of the worldviews which underpin them. Uh, and this is the latest version of a thing called the system of systems methodologies, uh, which tries to do that. Uh, and what it basically points to uh, are that different systems approaches uh, see the world differently and seek to change the world in different ways, according to way that, the way that they see the world. Um, so Dave, in his introduction, was saying there's this whole uh, set of uh, systems ideas, and it can appear to be intimidating to people who come newly to the area of systems thinking. But I would say to you that we can, in fact, find a pattern uh, behind these different systems approaches, methodologies and methods, uh, if we look at the way in which they 
are based upon different perceptions of reality, different ways of looking at the world. And this is the conclusion I came to in the book that I wrote in 2019. Um, you can, in fact, look at different systems approaches, different systems methodologies, according to how they look at the systems in the world and how they look at stakeholders and the relationship between stakeholders. So hard systems approaches see the world mechanistically and concentrate upon modeling it. They regard it as a case of restricted complexity uh, and model it as uh, to see, to learn about it and to predict and control it better. System dynamics sees the world as much more complicated uh, looks for cause-effect relationships impacting each other in feedback and feed-forward loops and impacted by lags, uh, cause and effects which, you, which, are, which are separated in, in time and space. It has a more complicated view of reality. Stafford Beer's viable system model uh, doesn't believe you can anticipate what's going to happen. You can't include all environmental factors in your models in the way that system dynamicists seek to do. In their endogenous approach. So he develops a model which is capable of responding and reacting and adapting and changing to the way the world changes. But still no real um, attention to stakeholders and their different views and opinions uh, and ways of seeing the world. That comes about in soft systems thinking with the work of people such as Aikoff and Churchman and Checkland uh, and many others. Who, who see systems thinking about as being about looking at different systemic interpretations of the world uh, brought to the party by different stakeholders and seeking to bring about accommodations uh, between those so that action can be taken. Uh, and then the problem with that, of course, is that not all stakeholders have an equal say. Power impacts um, who wins the debate can influence the way that debate goes. And so we need to bring to the fore, uh, the points of view of disadvantaged uh, groups. And that was uh, a position uh, which is advanced in critical systems uh, heuristics. So you have different systems approaches uh, which act on the world in different ways because they see the world in different ways and they emphasize different things about complexity. Um, the ones on the left of that diagram emphasize the systems and the complexity within the systems themselves. Uh, the ones as you go along the uh, horizontal dimension, more attention to uh, the complexity brought by the stakeholders with their different perceptions of the world and the operation of power in the world. Now, the way I think of it nowadays is, is like this, that as systems thinking has uh, developed, it's developed different responses to complexity. So you can see the history of the development of systems thinking as being an attempt to cope with different aspects uh, of complexity. And I want to relate that back uh, to those partial truths uh, that uh, I uh, identified uh, earlier. And it so happens that within the systems movement, uh, we've developed ways of responding to the world uh, engaging with it, seeking to improve it, according to each of those uh, systemic perspectives or partial truths that I identified earlier. Now, it so happens, I said, but it's not surprising, is it? Because if these are the things which somehow cause problems to us as a human species uh, and things which we need to deal with to manage our engagements with the world, then it's not surprising that we've developed tools in the systems movement that can help us uh, to enhance and take forward those uh, partial truths. So responding to the partial truth of mechanism, uh, we have systems engineering, lean systems models, the work coming from Deming and uh, in the UK, the Vanguard model, um, which is about doing things right. It's about efficiency and efficacy incredibly important in improving the systems which we operate with. Responding to the organismic view, po point of view, we have socio-technical or open systems uh, models. Uh, Dave mentioned the work of Marilyn Emery, who has been flying the flag, still continues to fly the flag 
for socio-technical systems thinking, or she calls it open systems theory. And Beer's viable systems approach can be seen primarily as an organismic model. And, and these approaches promote adaptability, resilience, and anti-fragility. Incredibly important things to think about uh, it, when, you're con when you're confronted with any uh, system that you're seeking to deal with or improve. The purposeful systems perspective has given rise to soft systems approaches, doing the right things, thinking about debating whether we're doing the right things, how to bring about mutual understanding, how to bring about accommodations between different perspectives, uh, how to manage conflict in a way which is productive to organizations rather than uh, endangering their progress. And a societal environmental perspective gives rise to emancipatory systems approaches, such as critical systems heuristics, which seeks to bring to the fore issues of marginalization, disadvantage, inequality, and the environmental issues, which might otherwise be forgotten about, not embraced, uh, and the interests of future generations. An interrelationships perspective is highlighted by system dynamics the important linkages which offer leverage points for achieving improvements uh, or highlight possible unintended consequences. And aren't we therefore in a pretty powerful position in the systems movement if we can embrace all this variety of different strands of systems thinking uh, through the philosophy of pragmatism uh, as partial truths, as ways of developing useful habits of action uh, to deal with complexity. So critical systems thinking, the final slide, is about a pragmatic approach to general complexity, not seeking to stand back, believing we're separate from the world, not seeking eternal truths, but learning by engagement with the world. Practical, we're part of the world, we're engaged with it, we can't be separate from it. We learn by engaging with it. Uh, because there can be no universal truth, uh, it has to be multi-perspectival. Pepper says we need all world hypotheses so far as they are adequate for mutual comparison and correction of interpretive bias. So we can trade them off among themselves. If we're pursuing mechanical improvement, we can look at the impact that's having in terms of uh, the organismic worldview or the emancipatory worldview. It has to be multiple, multi-methodological. Uh, we need to appreciate the strengths and weaknesses of different methodologies, understand how each has a limited perception of the nature of the world, and then we can perhaps use them in combination to deal with multi-dimensional complexity. And you have to be flexible in the use of them. This is perhaps the most difficult thing uh, for people trained in approaches such as in systems engineering. How do you develop a flexible mindset? How you enable yourself to see the world in different ways? How can you come to operate multi-methodologically? Uh, it's difficult, but it's crucial. Uh, as Kay and King, King was an ex-governor um, of the Bank of England, Kay, a well-known philosopher, a recent book on radical uncertainty say, the mark of the first-rate decision maker confronted by radical uncertainty is to organize action around a reference narrative, I'd call that a partial truth or a systemic perspective, while still being open to both the possibility that this narrative is false and that alternative narratives uh, might be relevant. Flexibility is all important. And we're seeking to bring about general improvements. So we'll evaluate any intervention we're engaged in, in terms of the partial perspectives. Is it bringing greater efficiency and effectiveness? Is it making more, more adaptable and flexible and bringing about anti-fragility? Is it increasing mutual understanding so that people are on the same page in terms of doing the right things? Is it uh, ensuring that those most disadvantaged have a voice and are being benefited as well by the intervention? And is it a taking account of interrelationships and so seeking as far as possible so this will never be possible as a whole to, to avoid unintended uh, consequences. So I present to you a, a, a vision of a, a unified uh, systems approach, 
uh, based upon the philosophy of pragmatism, which helps us to understand why we have a variety of different systems approaches, puts a pattern onto it. And I think that on this basis, we can yet further advance uh, the systems movement as a whole. But even more importantly, we can use these very significant uh, and powerful ideas uh, to improve the organizations and the world in which we uh, live. So I'm going to stop there with that uh, with that message. Uh, and that's that's the book in which these ideas are most developed, though, uh, even as a veteran, I'm continuing to develop the ideas and some of the stuff you've seen today uh, is new and beyond that book. Thank you. Let's come off mute there. Thanks, Michael. Um, got a few questions in the chat, but I'm sure some will also emerge as we start to get into um, asking a few questions. Um, Benjamin Taylor, uh, first question actually comes from you. Uh, many complexity aligned folks seem to be hardcore realists. Um, is that your observation as well, Michael, or do you want to talk to that at all, um, Benjamin? Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Hi, Mike. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I really, I really oh, hi, Benjamin. I'm, I'm, I'm so excited by uh, hearing all this as I am every time, Mike. These are just my thoughts thinking along. Um, and, and I guess my, my questions are a little bit kind of like, um, this is your view, which I happen to agree with. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm, I'm not sure that everybody agrees with those interpretations. Um, and I guess I cited Dave Snowden talking about realism. Um, and even in his last book, Patrick Hoverstadt talks about isomorphism between the map and the territory uh, as a goal or a, or a value. So it feels to me as though there's a bit more realism out there than, than you're talking about in, 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 in a way, particularly in complexity. No, it's a, it's a good point, um, Benjamin, for this reason, I think. Um, I, I can be hoist on my own petard because I'm trying to unify the systems movement. Uh, but in actual fact, I've begun to come to the conclusion that we need to expel some stuff from the systems movement um, and unify behind those things which have got a sensible philosophy and uh, a sensible theory behind them and which enable us to engage with 20th century, um, 21st century philosophy, um, you know, which has gone beyond uh, the kind of thinking which uh, still hangs on in some areas of general system theory and in, in, in some areas of complexity, uh, some areas of complexity theory. Um, so, you know, attempting to model human behavior with agent-based modeling is, is, is to me um, so backward that I, 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 I no longer want to uh, give that the benefit of calling it a systems approach. So if that goes, then that's fine. <laughs> Let's unify around the sensible aspects of the, uh, uh, of the systems approach. Um, I've got trouble with things like hardcore general systems theory because, after all, that's where a lot of systems thinking got 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 started. But I do get annoyed with people who um, are seeking. Uh, I come across them in systems engineering all the time. I've been arguing, particularly vociferously, over the last few months and years about about you know people who are trying to convince, convince systems engineers that if we wait long enough, uh, then we're somehow going to arrive at general systems laws that will tell them how to act in a scientific way, whatever system they happen to be dealing with, in attempting to extend their scope uh, beyond technical systems to socio-technical systems. And I've just come to saying that that's like waiting for Godot, you know, you'll, you'll, it'll never come. So, so let's get on, let's get on with doing something useful and take advantage of the variety of systems approaches we already have uh, to address uh, the, the human and the political and the other aspects and the resilience aspects of, uh, of, of complexity. You're never, you're never going to find these um, general systems laws that cope with a lot. And you won't because of emergence at different levels uh, and different, Bertland for himself, you know, different forms of interrelationship, interaction at different systems levels. I, I could go on about von Bertland but because he wasn't a hardline general systems theorist, but I won't at this stage. So I joined your discussion, Benjamin, rather than answered your question. <laughs> I, I mean, the question of boundaries in unifying systems thinking is uh, is a really important one, isn't it? So it's good to good that you you raised that. I think. Mm. Thank you. Cool. 
Um, Tron, you've made a comment that um, Maryland Emory is actually element that OST is um, based on contextualism and not on organicism. Yeah, oh, that's, a, that's a question a... with her on that because uh, if you want to distinguish OST from SDS, uh, and that is mainly why she's sort of adamant that that is the contextualism she's the, the whole thing is based on. Yeah, yeah um, I, I that's right, she does. Um, and socio technical system thinking is a really interesting. Um, uh, a really interesting strand of the systems approach. Um, it actually was based upon machine mechanical foundations in its early days. If you read Tristan Bamforth uh, on long wall mining, this is going back in the history of systems thinking a long time, it's based upon the disturbance of equilibrium that, mm -hmm. that they say uh, the introduction of the long wall method didn't work. Um, now that, that strand of sociotech didn't last long and, and, it, and they read von Bertlanffy, uh, and uh, Emmy and Trist developed uh, an organismic vision uh, which underpinned uh, socio-technical systems thinking uh, and uh, was um, uh, 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 and led to many of the great socio-technical experiments, uh, the Norwegian Industrial Democracy Project, uh, Shell's New Philosophy of Management, the Kalmar Project. In, in my view, uh, socio-technical systems thinking had its heyday um, when it exploited the organismic model, uh, that was when it was powerful. It was extremely good uh, when it was getting the most it could out of that organismic way of thinking. Now, then there was a further shift, which um, it would have been Fred Emery who said, well, our problem with, the, with, with this organismic model is that we, we're asking, and he was still in the Norwegian Industrial Democracy Project, we're asking workers to trust us that, that our ways <laughs> of talking about uh, the best way to design work uh, and the best form of jobs, uh, we know that uh, through our organismic thinking. Our mistake, our mistake was, and we said, uh, that we didn't learn from you, we didn't listen from you, we were trying to impose an organismic model. And, and hence, Emery said that we need this break uh, uh, to contextualism in um, uh, in um, uh, in Pepper's terms, uh, and Marilyn Emery is a very uh, strong advocate that socio-technical system thinking has made the break to contextualism uh, away from uh, the organismic perspective. I'd say two things. First, uh, if it has, it's not been very successful uh, because its heyday was when it embraced the organismic model. Secondly, I don't believe it has. Uh, because if, if you look, uh, I fully respect Marilyn Emery's work, by the way, and you should all listen to her and, and engage with what, what she has to say. But uh, underpinning that, there are still organismic uh, ways of thinking uh, which people are expected to arrive at, as it were. So hidden there, uh, you've always got to come up, you've always got to end up with some kind of democratic form of organisation. Uh, which operates in a particular way, uh, actually an organismic way, in order to function well in terms of adapting to its environment. So the contextualism is still in the service of an organismic overall vision, uh, in my view. So in the system of systems methodologies, um, I, I'd still place socio-technical systems thinking as an attempt as in an organismic kind of perspective when I would in a stakeholder perspective. I, I've argued this. Uh, I, I remember Marilyn Emery had a really big bust up in the journal that I edit, uh, Systems Research and Behavioral Science, with some people um, who were saying, uh, who, who were criticizing socio-technical systems thinking uh, because, because it had not uh, got away from organismic thinking, if you like. Uh, and she was right to some extent because those people hadn't read the OST stuff. Nevertheless, uh, those critics were right in that, in the sense that I've just explained, um, that um, she hasn't, in my view, fully escaped the organismic model. Uh, now, I, I don't mind that because the organismic model is a powerful model uh, uh, and you can get so much out of it. All these things are worth doing. But 
you know, if you're interested, look at the chapter in my book about socio-technical systems thinking, where this debate is developed. You, you don't have to agree with what I'm saying. Marilyn Emery would have a different view. Uh, but, you know, have a look at that debate because it, I, I have tried to go into it in depth. Thank you very much. Uh, Jean's got a question, I think, around uh, about the pragmatism of pragmatism here, Jean. <laughs> Oh, well, I'm, I'm still trying to, to understand, you say, you're trying to unify the system movements, and, I, and I, I can't figure out what that means. No, Gene, that's because you see the systems movement as being system dynamics. I don't know, somebody's, um, somebody's frozen now. Is it me or Jean? Say what? Sorry, Jean, you, you, I couldn't hear you for a minute. No, I, I said you, you indicated that you want to unify the system movements. And, and I'm saying that I don't quite understand what that means. And you said that I look at the system movements as system dynamics. And I haven't done that for years since I read your last book. Okay, uh, good. Which, which, was, which was a tremendous turning point in my thought patterns in terms Thank you. of, in other words, there was a time that I thought system thinking was just a not very grown up version of system dynamics. But I yeah. couldn't understand why we had thousands of models and methods that claimed to embrace the systems paradigm till I read your book. All right. And then I said, oh, I understand why we have all these different approaches. And then I became terribly depressed because I realized that I wasn't that smart. Right? So, and I have been trying to understand what it would mean to, to unify all of the different methodologies and models so that we don't have this pseudo-religious war of the methodologies i mean yeah. it's like a religion you know people glam on to an approach that they're comfortable with and and then they gotta fly that banner and and everything else is useless except my approach which i think is ridiculous well i'm i'm 100 with you there um gene yes i i think it is ridiculous and I, all i can say is that i've been working throughout my career since I started with the system and systems methodology to show that these things um, have complementary ways of being used. Uh, I don't think you can integrate them because they, they, are, they do offer different partial truths and different ways of acting, uh, but you can certainly respect them all. Uh, and that's why pragmatism is, is the potentially unifying philosophy uh, because you're not offering competing ways of understanding the world you know, paradigms which are incommensurable. You're offering ways of engaging with the world uh, and trying out in any, in, any, in any particular circumstances, uh, which of these is gonna give you some sort of traction, some sort of ability to bring about uh, improvement in the world. So, I mean, a lot of this, as John Bensley, I can see there, I was, uh, when I've been in Australia, I've, I've generally worked on, on things like project management uh, and with, with QUT. And it benefits you, you see, to see a project not just um, as a, a way of achieving a fixed goal in a mechanistic uh, sense, but also as something that evolves over its life cycle and adapts and changes. It, it benefits you to see it as um, uh, the bringing together of different stakeholders to try and achieve uh, various objectives where they may disagree about certain things. It helps you to see it as possibly disadvantaging some people rather than, uh, you know, while you're pursuing an overall project objective. It helps you to see it as a set of interrelated parts that might, that, that might conflict, get in each other's way rather than contributing towards uh, the success of what you're trying to achieve. Now, I don't think these things can be, these ways of thinking can be integrated, but I do think they all offer valuable alternative ways uh, of looking at something like a, a project. And anybody running a project who has access 
to these different partial truths uh, will be in a much better position than someone uh, who is restricted uh, by having only one maybe systems methodology at their disposal reflecting one partial truth. I don't know whether that helps, Jean. You know, I'm on the same page as you, but I do think it's achievable. Uh, and I've got out of that depression that you're, uh, <laughs> you're still stuck in by reading your extremely, uh, and I do not know why, look, why Western philosophy has not taken more account of uh, US, um, US pragmatism, because that philosophy is powerful. Uh, and when I said, you know, I said to Benjamin earlier, um, uh, let's get up, I mean, forget the crap, you know, let's unify systems thinking around proper philosophy, pragmatism. I'm, I'm not saying, you know, that this linguistic turn in philosophy, which Charles Pierce <laughs> effectively enacted, uh, is what all 20th and 21st century philosophy is about in Wittgenstein. Wittgenstein, language games, the concepts are tools for action. They're not attempts to understand the world in philosophical investigations. In Heidegger, concepts are tools for action. Uh, it's ridiculous to seek eternal wisdom. We're, we're never, we're, we're limited human beings. We evolved in particular ways to deal with the world in particular ways. Uh, and that's how we should see our philosophy. Uh, as helping us to manage the world, uh, not to gain eternal godlike truth about truth about the world. I don't know whether, have I got you out of your depression? <laughs> the, the, <laughs> the, the depression was the realization that I, I had struggled to become somewhat fluid in, in system dynamics for a number of years, and then realizing that Oh, now I got to learn a dozen different approaches, and I, I'm not that smart. Okay, that no, was where I mean, the impression came from. Neither, neither am I. Neither am I. I don't, I'm not good at all those approaches. But I, no way. But I, I, I am. I have I believe I have put a pattern on those approaches, uh, which will make it easier for people to understand the variety of those approaches. Uh, and try them out and see when they're reasonable, bring in people who are better at the particular approaches than I might be or others might be, uh, according, to the, according to the circumstances. And you won't know which of them work until you actually engage with, uh, uh, with the world. I'm not, I'm not asking people to be, I'm pretending an ideal type, if you like. Uh, and in practice, the ideal type I present won't be realizable. Um, because there are always constraints in the world that, that impact will impact what you, what approaches you can use, which you can't. But you can always refer back to this and think, well, you know, maybe I should have given consideration to this, maybe I should have given consideration to that. Uh, and to understand the world through these different partial truths and have these different ways of acting in the world uh, is beneficial. I've been engaged with discussions with the World Health Organization, people in the World Health Organization. Uh, and and their attempts to engage with policymakers and to have systems thinking more accepted by policymakers in the World Health Organization has failed because uh, the kind of systems thinking they embrace uh, is presenting policymakers with large system dynamics models. And I said, well, I'm not. You, you know, that you can't expect policymakers to engage with those models. Uh, look at the world differently. I don't see it just like as a set of interrelationships which you can model. Uh, see health systems as the need to be more resilient. See them as bringing stakeholders together. Mm. See them as achieving particular goals efficiently. See them as bringing about more equality. Then you might have some traction with the decision makers that you're seeking to policy makers that you're trying to influence. Stick a great big system dynamics model on them and they'll never get anywhere. <laughs> Well, we might uh, we might move on to the next uh, question. Olson, Olson, do you have something to add to that uh, that query? If I may, if I may, very shortly, because I know I know we don't have time. It is fantastic to see Mike bringing Bogdano and his contribution uh, within the context in relation to the question of unity of systems field. I um, the direction of my research is now. It's very much about this topic, um, but also uh, I think I found something really interesting in, because um, 
this unity debate is emerging and uh, going uh, coming coming back and uh, disappearing um, within the field of philosophy of science. There's a very similar unity debate. Uh, actually, this unity this unity of science was a kind of norm. Uh, last three four decades now now the unity of, of science idea is coming back it's really interesting to see like the movements uh, transdisciplinarity movement is initiated by Morin Edgar Morin uh, or interdisciplinarity movements initiated by Piaget very much systems uh, people complexity people and also uh, unity of science systems, general systems theory emerges as a new approach to unity of science uh, by Berta Lanfi. And also Bogdanov comes with a unified, unifying science at the beginning. So this relationship between philosophy of science, which is which itself emerges as a meta science, which can be applied. I mean, when we look at the Vienna Circle people and the Neocantians, they all think about um, philosophy of science as a meta, meta science you can apply uh, based on mathematical logic um, to, to all different fields of science. Um, it is very interesting relationship between why, when why Vienna Circle doesn't uh, able to manage this to, to show that philosophy of science based on logical mathematics is the, the unifying method. Um, that, that it's interesting. But Bertalanffy comes in as a systems theory with, with the systems theory as a unifying science. Um, this interplay between philosophy of science and systems complexity thinking is really interesting. I think we should figure out we should figure out what went wrong and how can we uh, re uh, reapproach re to this question? Because now, for example, within the philosophy of science. There's a re re return of the unity of debates, unity of science debate. So, so it's like transdisciplinarity and interdisciplinarity phase is um, retreating, and the discussion is coming back. But based on what? It's not logical. It's not logic. It's not linguistic, uh, mathematical logic. So, wh what is that uh, ground? I think Bogdanov has a really interesting, sharp, uh, creative approach uh, by looking at everything from an organizational point of view is, is a um, really creative approach. Anyway, it's really exciting that to see this, this whole dialogues are going on. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, it is awesome. And um, it's interesting the links with the Vienna circle, um, but Bert Lanfi clearly was linked in there. So it was Karl Popper uh, and Wittgenstein in the Tractatus was trying to develop a unified logical language which could underpin uh, different sciences. But of course, Wittgenstein moved away from that, uh, much much closer to the sort of pragmatic position that I've been trying to describe in in, in this lecture today. And I just just read a really nice book. You might you might want to have a look at it, called Wittgenstein's Poker, because when uh, uh, Popper, representing if you like a unified science perspective from the Vienna Circle, uh, only met Wittgenstein once. Wittgenstein by this time had changed to away from Tractatus philosophical investigations and language games, a much more pragmatic approach. And it ended with Wittgenstein trying to hit Popper over the head with a poker uh, in a seminar room in Cambridge. <laughs> and, and that book, Wittgenstein's Poker, uh, in a sense, addresses this issue of uh, the potential for the universe in a nice novelistic, but not, it's not a novelist, it's an attempt to reconstruct what happened uh, leading up to that debate between Popper and Wittgenstein, uh, but it's about that kind of issue. We won't be hitting each other on, over the heads with, uh, with pokers or, <laughs> or sun, but if you carry on the, on the unity of science view, then I, I might be hitting you over the head with something. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. We've, we've actually reached time. Um, I wonder, Mike, if you can stay around for a few more questions, if that's possible. Yeah, it's not a problem. Right. For anybody who has to leave, thanks for joining us. And um, we'll make the, um, the video available when we've got it um, ready to go. Uh, the next question that we have in the chat was from Pat. Um, I was trying to find that. Pat McKenna. Uh, Pat, do you want to ask your question, mate? 
Uh, yeah. Hi, Mike. Um, Hi. Thanks. Thanks for the presentation and the and the chat. Um, I was wanting to get an idea of where you're heading with the system of systems methodologies, because you, you showed us tonight um, on that slide, there were five methodologies there. Are you slimming down the number of methodologies or was that just a, a simplified version for tonight? Uh, the, the, the system of systems methodology Pat, has been subject to a lot of misunderstanding in my view, of which I was partly at fault in the early days and people tried to, say well if we can classify a problem into one of these boxes then we can choose a methodology that um, is suitable for it and uh, clearly that's not a, a, that's not a very good way of looking at it um, so you, you have a range of systems methodologies available to us uh, and as it says it's an attempt to be a system of systems methodologies to look at what they're good at what, what they emphasize what they're strong at doing and what they're weaker at doing what they can address and what they can't uh, address, uh, but I, I, I also I'm conscious that you can't you can't pin um, methodologies down quite as easy as we might have thought that uh, was possible in the early days, which is why I presented it with fuzzy edges and all the rest of it. Uh, the 2019 book has a more uh, has more method. Uh, the 2019 book chooses ten methodologies that I feel have been most influential in the systems movement in the sense that they have good theory behind them uh, and have been used practically. Uh, and I relate those to the system uh, of systems methodology. So that's the most developed uh, uh, version of it. Uh, I presented it tonight just as a, as a way of, to this morning for me, uh, just, as, just as a way of, of saying what that system of systems methodologies uh, was actually about. Um, but it's still incredibly useful in my view. I mean, uh, okay uh, socio-technical systems thinking it went through a mechanistic phase an organismic phase and now Beverly and Emmy want to take it to a, a purposeful systems phase well to me I can chart that development across the system and systems methodologies I can understand why you want to get away from the mechanistic stuff because uh, they, they, they found that the environment the environment was so influential and they had to deal with that so they brought in organismic thinking and then I said that's why it's more powerful so that's why I stick it now but I can see also that Marilyn Emery understands that you, you have to have much more engagement with stakeholders than the, orig the original socio-technical people uh, were trying to do so she's seeking to move it in a contextless direction I don't think she succeeded but there you go but there's the system system that was being used to track uh, a methodology as it changes its emphasis so you can pin it down in terms of the different different ways in which it's developing and what it's what it's providing insight into does that does that help Pat? yeah great thank you cool. um john are you still with us i'm not sure if yeah john's still there john mortimer um really more of a comment than a question do you want to just go through that really quickly john uh, hi there. I hope you can hear me. Um, yeah, I find it. I find it really interesting that I'll start with the last bit of the comment that systems thinking almost got stuck in a reductionist space where people were focused just on their element of systems thinking. And now, Mike, what you're doing is helping to understand that systems thinking is not about one or the other. It's about focusing on the problem itself and then bringing bringing that understanding to the problem space rather than having a hammer and uh, looking for always uh, dealing with 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 things as though they were nails what's yeah. interesting i find is that a lot of the uh, newer people that are coming into systems thinking are are coming at it from perhaps a different direction to the academic functional approach that it was in the past and looking at just tell me what it is in, in a very brief example, um, where it's about the connections between things, or it's about standing back and looking at things as a whole, and then going into each of the elements and looking at it that way. And I find that a very healthy, a very healthy uh, way of beginning the journey of systems thinking, which, I mean, Mike, you gave a good example of, of the WHO. How do you approach an, a large organization? How do you approach people? first with something that they can grasp and make sense to them and then carry on that journey of learning about systems thinking 
Yeah, I think you, you and I agree on most things, John, but um, I worry about what you've just said in this sense, that the, uh, the, there are a number of ways on the table of, um, uh, of trying to provide a pattern uh, behind a variety of systems approaches. In other words, so that you can have, somebody all calls it an elevator pitch um, that will convince people. Uh, let, let me put the two to you in opposition. Um, there's DSRP, which is the Kubera version, uh, which I think is an, extent, uh, an extension of what you, you just said. You, you introduce people through the concepts of distinctions and relationships, perspectives, systems, etc. That's one way of doing it. Um, my way of doing it is, as I've just explained, is uh, to say, well, actually, let's work out what partial truths are useful to us and see whether we've got systems approaches. Uh, and therefore say, well, like, actually, we, we can we can pin this field down and, and say that uh, certain approaches are, are pursue a, a mechanistic agenda, some are, are, are contextualist, some are um, uh, an organismic agenda. Now, I don't think that's complicated. I think that's as easy to understand as DSRP. The advantage it has over DSRP is that it's philosophically tenable and it's not confusing. DSRP is philosophically untenable and incredibly confusing uh, because uh, the way that each form of system thinking describes the concepts, distinctions, perspectives, systems, etc., uh, is different. Um, so within a system dynamics approach, relationships are cause effect relationships, um, uh, concatenating feedback, feed forward loops. Within uh, a soft systems approach, relationships are relationships between worldviews uh, of, different, of different stakeholders, totally different, totally different things. So D DSRP is old philosophy. It, it's the notion that somehow a concept like relationships has a meaning in the world so that we can say, there's a relationship, I can spot it, I can see it, and I can talk about it. And the word has a meaning out of its context. Uh, words don't have meaning out of their context. This is the whole thrust, as been saying, of pragmatism, of 20th century, 21st century philosophy. World, words have meaning when they're related to other words, as signs, uh, within a language game. Uh, so, I mean, DSRP, frankly, is bullshit. I mean, I mean, it's so bad. And you, you can see how... Um, you know, somebody, uh, it, this, this, this kind of systems concepts approach, as I call it, has gained traction in the systems evaluation field. So people say, hang on, um, if you want to convince evaluators to use systems thinking, tell them about relationships, perspectives, and that. Well, what do you do with that? Every, everybody means something different by those things. Uh, all the different systems approaches use them differently. You're so in confusion. So, it's philosophically untenable to believe there are things in the world that you can identify as relationships or that there are, um, or, or that you can know exactly what's meant by those ideas. So you have to bring them back uh, to what Pepper calls their root metaphors or their world hypotheses. And relationships, just take that as an example again, has a particular meaning within the machine metaphor, a particular meaning within the organismic, and a particular meaning with these others. Now, these are all useful ways of using that concept, and the same with the rest of them. But you see what I mean? That, that's philosophically tenable. That, that relates to pragmatism. It relates to world hypotheses. It relates to partial truth. And it explains that it, it's making use of systems ideas uh, to support these partial, in a powerful ways, to support these partial perspectives. But the, the idea that these concepts have a meaning which you can suddenly understand, uh, have some sort of eternal verity, is just crap. <laughs> so, you know, I can understand the, the, the desire to have an elevator pitch for systems thinking, but we've got to have an elevator pitch that has integrity. Um, and, you know, that's what I'm seeking to pursue. Oh. I have that on the shop for John. Uh, thank you. No, I think, uh, I think, Mike, you've made, you've made a really interesting point there where mm. 
almost uh, it seems like where you're going is the fundamental element of systems thinking is worldview uh, in one way. And yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, that, that's right. Uh, systemic, yeah. um, but sy I call it systemic perspectives because yeah. You know, they're gestalt, the, the holistic ways of seeing the world. So I don't think that's a problem with that, I don't, uh, yeah. um, uh, uh, of, do, of doing that. But yes, you're right. I do see that as more important in a sense than the, than the concepts, the concepts themselves. We ain't going to, as system thinkers, you know, we've got we to gotta be less arrogant. We ain't going to solve problems that 2,500 years of philosophy has, has, has been dealing with and seeking to, to tackle, you know, Aristotle v. Plato, I don't know, systems yeah. thinking, just bring the concept of distinctions to it, that'll solve the fucking problem. Yeah. Well, it won't. You know, that we have these different perspectives, these different worldviews, and we can employ systems ideas productively to enhance those worldviews, but it ain't going to replace these visions, root metaphors, world hypotheses, which have been around and dividing philosophers, sociologists, and the rest and the rest for thousands of years. Hmm. Thanks, Mike. Uh, well, just uh, I'm getting some, some soft pressure from Ali that now to re-mention the, the course with Merrill, Merrill and Emery uh, coming up hopefully in August. So just thought I'd mention that again. Um, yeah, like, like Mike says, she, she is pretty amazing. Um, and I think it's, it's always interesting when you're learning new stuff and going to, to see these things that you can actually get these different perspectives as well. And I think it is about holding these multiple perspectives on, on what, um, what is we're looking at in the systems thinking as well. Well, I was, I was much, um, uh, I was excited when I saw that uh, Fred Emery had drawn heavily on Pepper in thinking his way through the changes that they were making in socio-technical systems thinking. So there's certainly very much common ground um, there bet between what I've been saying and, and what mm -hmm. Marilyn Emery is pursuing in trying to take socio-technical systems thinking, if you like, shifting it, uh, providing its strength to another worldview, contextualism, she would say, mm -hmm. rather than the organismic view, which has served well in the past. My view is that it's better sticking with its organismic um, stuff because that's where it relates more, most closely and, um, and is most valuable. Yeah. It's, um, a it's a huge, it's a huge opportunity for this community that you're, you're giving this community to engage with Marilyn Emery. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, it's um, it is a big opportunity. We're, we're pretty amazed at, at actually bringing it to, to this group. So hopefully, we get to get to get a few tickets sold, as it were. But um, we won't talk about <laughs> ticket sales right now. Um, and if you, but if you're interested, reach out to the community. We'll we'll put more details up as they as they come through. Um, awesome. You had a pretty um, Pretty on the on the spot sort of question there about the linguistic models. Mm, well, I I was trying to formulate the question to Mike because what I see in Bogdan of this organizational point of view, organizational scientific monistic worldview is really important. I mean, he reaches to this conclusion. He thinks this is not something new in Spinoza, Peirce, Marx. He sees everywhere this evolution of this worldview, world hypothesis. So he thinks like this. I mean, language is, is, is itself like an old ideological, ideological forms. It is, a, it is to organize the world, it is to organize yeah, human Yeah, absolutely, action. absolutely. That's the pragmatism of, uh, in, in Bogdanov, yeah. Exactly. Um, so this language itself emerges like all the other social institutions in relation to uh, human relation to nature. And yeah. he called activities and resistances. So he sees these activities and resistances everywhere, like in language. So, so language and mathematics is not one specific ground to unite everything, but it is itself an organization. You can look at language and mathematics as an organizational tool. Uh, so, so this idea of looking at everything from organizational point of view, mechanistic, organismic, uh, linguistic, you can look at everything as an organizational uh, process. So, so this this grounding of uh, he says, I mean, this is not something new. Um, but but by, by looking at form formulating mechanisms like emergence for how new uh, complexes emerges and how they are regulated, how they are transforming in forms or uh, decay. 
uh, so, so science itself, you can look at science as an organizational process, uh, idea, ideas, social processes. So this, this is a really strong uh, argument. I think Morin, Edgar Morin is making is, is exactly the same point in his uh, volume one, uh, Nature, uh, the, the method, the, the nature of the nature. Uh, this is, uh, I don't know how to uh, formulate it, but do you see when you look at linguistic worldview or ling linguistic turn? Oh yeah, the really linguistic linguistic turn is has got to be accepted, and and um, uh, Bogdanov is the best. Well, Dewey as well, and this is why I started making these links. They 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 both see um, language uh, uh, as relating to people's engagement with the world. They say Bogdanov is the uh, is the strongest in, in the way that he he says. Well, actually, it's uh, language developed as part of social organization uh, as we seek to do tasks and engage with the world the natural world and then the social world which is important um i mean this is going to take us in the realm of philosophy or some I, i'd say this only that there's a tension in bogdanov in my view between his philosophy and his technology between imperial monism and um and technology and it's interesting that you find the same tension in von bertalanffy between his perspectivism and his more mathematical general system theory. Um, now, I've not entirely worked through that um, tension, and, I, I, and at the moment, I'm finding it hard to understand how von Bertalanffy could embrace perspectivism and press for mathematical general systems theory, and how Bogdanov could have the pragmatist views he has uh, espoused in um, imperial monism and the hard line uh, technological perspective in 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 the technology so still trying to work on on that one uh, and I, I, I if i have to put my money i'll put it on the perspectivism and the imperial monism and and see as something less useful the technology and the general system, mathematical general system theory thanks um well i think Benjamin Tyler left us unfortunately had to run off. Uh, he's saying the concept of affordances is a really powerful concept in this space, very much like the tools for action as well. Uh, but we'll try to, to start to wind things up probably about another 10 minutes before uh, 7 p.m. here, and I, I do want to have my dinner tonight. So, um, hang on, I've got to have my breakfast. <laughs> yeah. uh, John Bensley, uh, metaphor of the orchestra, and I think we've actually uh, had further sort of discussions in the chat. It's more like a more like a jazz ensemble than an orchestra. Yeah, I'm sorry, I don't I don't read the chat because I find it too <laughs> too distracting when I'm when I'm talking. I think um, John's just talking about the arrangement of harmonies and multiple uh, instruments working in concordance, uh, not discordant. Um, and I think uh, John Mortimer then uh, said it's more like, not so much like um, an orchestra, but well, which is a well-planned symphony, you know, that's all planned out, but maybe more like improvisational or unstructured jazz in terms of um, creating music. Yeah. But, well, look, I'm being refreshed with coffee. Thank you. <laughs> that's, that's bad news for you lot. I can keep, I can keep going forever now. <laughs> Cool. Well, I, both well, those met, both those metaphors are extremely useful. The, mm -hmm. um, the 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 orchestra one obviously is a is one. Well, I don't, I don't know whether I like I like it so much um, because it is a bit of a top down um, um, approach. You know, everything decided in advance by the uh, by by the um, composer and, and the conductor. Um, Maybe maybe the jazz one is is better. There's, um, I, I just call to mind is Brian, Brian Eno when talking about trying to explain the viable system model. Um, talking uses I think called the gardening metaphor where you know if you uh, if you're trying to create a great garden, you you might have some sort of plan and you you'll know something about the soil and the plants and what they can do. Um, but it's improvisation, really. You, you have to see what comes up, what doesn't come up, what grows well, what doesn't grow well. Um, and um, 
a great gardener won't plan everything in advance. They'll, they'll learn from their engagement with the uh, the nature, and and that's like the viable system model. You know, you you set it, you set an organisation loose in the world, design according design according to the viable system model, and learn what it's capable of in its environment. Um, uh, I suspect that's a bit closer to um, to jazz than it is the orchestra with the the musicians responding to each other and to their um, and to their audience. Yeah, it was actually more of a, a good example of the linguistic turn, Mike, because I uh, perhaps hadn't thought it through, but in the conversation you're having with Jean Bellinger about um, different different methodologies and, and and tools and so forth, I was I was just thinking that a, a multiple instrumentation. Um, whereby music is the emergent outcome of the combination. Um, I, I wasn't, I was, uh, uh, John, John picked me up on the uh, pre-planned symphony, uh, which was probably uh, just my lack, lack of thinking about it, because I wasn't certainly assuming that. I was just thinking that sometimes um, if you've got multiple instruments playing together, you're going to get a, a, uh, a more pleasing uh, emergent outcome than if you've just got one. Uh, or if you've got three of the same type, in actual fact, it's that creative combination um, of difference that can be both concordant and discordant. And that's where jazz is, 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 is a good one. Um, yeah, I mean, it's interesting to think through, isn't it? But I mean, the other, another problem, I guess, John, with the, with the orchestra thing is that you, you end up with a, a, a finished piece of work. It's, uh, and, and that, that, you know, we we can we can do this well, and we can come out with it, and yeah. we know what the answer is. And it, it's like there's a lack of Johnson come up with this distinction between a a, a puzzle metaphor and a chemical metaphor. Yeah. You know, the puzzle you can you can get right and feel aesthetically pleased if you like, like you might with a symphony. But the chemical metaphor is that things are constantly exploding, and, and it's like um, you deal with one issue, you bang that down if you like, and, and another one pops up, or you bang that down, the same the one that you, you thought you dealt with pops up again. Yeah. You know, there's all this thing fizzing about and you're trying to manage it as a, uh, as a whole set of issues that constantly uh, occur and recur and, yeah. Are you, are you so, suggesting that there's not a perfect metaphor or an all-encompassing, one, one metaphor to rule them all? <laughs> <laughs> there's not there certainly isn't one metaphor to, to rule them all but neither is there um neither is once you get to world hypotheses i mean peppers uh, i don't know he read peppers book but but i mean it's a controversial book but uh, he looks at the whole history of western philosophy and says that you can pin down uh, from what all these different philosophers have been saying uh for fundamentally useful world hypotheses that people have employed over time uh, and I've introduced a couple of others from social theory uh, and said, OK, well, let's have a look at these as, you know, things that have benefited humankind and have historically proven uh, to have benefited us to think in these ways. And so they're at a slightly deeper level than the sort of things like the orchestra or the jazz metaphor, which you could see, actually, you could illustrate, you know, be parts of these broader root metaphors in different ways. Um, and, and so I would... Uh, I, I, you know, it's, not, it, it, it's, it, it's certainly getting away from universal models, but it's also not, it's also uh, trying to resist the notion that anything goes. It's trying to, it's trying to um, say, well, some ways of thinking are more useful than others, and these are the ones which have been proven useful over time. Cool. Um, I'll stop asking questions from the chat, and the last four minutes we have before the turn of the hour. Does anybody have a, a burning question that they would like to ask Mike whilst we have him? I'd like to say thank you. <laughs> Definitely, thanks, Jane. Thanks, Jane. Yeah, I, I have a quick question if it's okay. Sure, John. Um, this idea of having uh, a common set of systems thinking general principles which i think uh, you're alluding to mike uh, that this isn't where we should be going we should be looking at uh the uh, individual methodologies and pulling them in uh, appropriately uh 
However, just looking at an organization, because I only really work with organizations and I do use some of these different elements, soft systems thinking, the more me mechanical um, flow, I tend to find that there are inherently fundamental principles that cover those. If you look at an organization and one of them, for instance, would be to stand back and look at the whole the whole flow end to end. Now, every organization I go to, that seems to be what we would do, whether it's a mechanistic, whether it's a soft, whatever it is, whether we're looking at stakeholders. As soon as we don't do that, we get into trouble regardless of the methodology. And I'm wondering within, let's just say organizations, um, applying systems thinking to organizations, that there does seem to be a common theme of the same types of principles coming up time and time again. And I'm wondering if that's a way of attempting of of where these different methodologies may link uh yeah i mean i i can see something in that john and to be in your point i was um at a, a seminar maybe it was at whole actually and just a couple of weeks ago and somebody was going on about um uh the the critical systems heuristics stuff and and how that was the basis of all systems thinking and you had to start with all that and somebody suddenly asked them, have you ever worked for a profit-making organization? <laughs> How many profit-making organizations have you worked for? And the, the answer was none. <laughs> so people's experience is, uh, is, is crucial in the way that they, they, they believe particular systems approaches are most useful. And, and of course, you're right, it, it, you know, um, uh, but you, if you find that approach one which gives you traction in the sort of organizations you deal with you you still i guess wouldn't uh, would regard yourself uh, as as better armored uh, and equipped if if you have these other approaches in the background and you don't forget that you might through improving the flow through an organization be making it less resilient or less adaptable for example um that that's what this approach, this is what this is about. It, it's um, having those, as John Kay put it, alternative narratives, um, which you can come to your aid, come to your aid when the, the narrative that you're using um, is um, uh, is not working or is, is bringing about results that you that you don't you, you, you don't want. And unless those alternative narratives are available in your brain from the beginning, you'll never see that the the narrative that's driving your particular approach is work is not working all you'll do is reinforce as you say the hammer thing you you'll try and hit the thing even harder um but yes i mean i think that's really important about uh the experience that different systems thinkers have had and and therefore the way that they prioritize uh, some of these metaphors or these world hypotheses over others. Cool, a good question to close on. I, I actually, I, I actually, I'm going to steal the last moment and ask a question as well. Um, you talked about um, sort of moving towards more of a general complexity sort of uh, approach to things rather than um, uh, being more more in the specific space. I was wondering, like. In, in political spheres, especially in Australia, and it's probably a cultural thing, that moving towards a more general sort of uh, complexity approach would have a low acceptance within the Australian culture. You see this happen with um, with politicians who necessarily, given context or a changing environment, have to change policy or have to change direction, seen as flip-flopping rather than responding to that um, general complexity. Um, is that a worldwide thing or is, that, is Australia specifically sort of like um, having problems with politics or do other no, I think better? It, I, I think it's it's general. I, um, the, the, the civil service in in the UK, uh, the cabinet office in the UK has, has became very, really interested in systems thinking, set up a systems thinking unit actually a mm. couple of years ago, got disbanded under COVID because people were sent to other areas. But Sir Patrick Vallance, um, who you've probably seen on your TVs, because he was always there with Boris. Um, he's the Chief Scientific Officer, Government Chief Scientific Officer, very interested in systems thinking. 
And so they decided to put together a system, as they call it, toolkit, although I was arguing all the time, it's more of a skill set. Um, and a lot of us were asked to, to sort of contribute to this. Uh, but the, the, pe the people who um, uh, were taking the lead in, in, in the cabinet office, this group that had been part of the schools, they had a very limited view of systems thinking. And it was that limited view that ultimately um, uh, prevailed uh, among the senior civil servants. Um, and it, it was much more straightforward, I would say, reductionist view of, of systems you know let's decide what the goal is let's model it uh, let's look at the best way to achieving the goal you know it's systems thinking that is 30 years old 40 years old and um, those of us who would consult were consulted in this were, felt pretty much being ignored and so we're going to we're going to construct an open letter uh, which says that the document says um, the, the, the document says that um, it's beyond our scope to discuss very interesting systems approaches such as um, uh, soft systems thinking, the viable system model, critical systems, heuristics and critical systems thinking. Well, to me, that's saying you're going to ignore everything that's happened in systems thinking over the last 30 years. And you're going to try and produce a document which uh, is useful to civil servants and policy policymakers, and you know I can't I can't. It's more of a system dynamics document that's emerged, and I can't see civil servants sitting down drawing stock flow stock and flow diagrams. I'm sorry, he isn't going to do that. Um, so this is very disappointing. But it, it's it's perhaps an example of what you, you you're describing there, Dave. Is that people people rather than engaging with complexity what want a more simple solution and but as somebody said you know there's lots of simple solutions about which are neat and uh, convincing but they're usually wrong um we we need we need to engage complexity with with solutions that you know respect that complexity not complex necessarily, say but respect the complexity with, with that they're engaging with mm. Yeah, I don't think Australia is unique in that um, complexity doesn't gain doesn't get votes for the thing that would come down to as well. Well, it doesn't, does it? It doesn't, does it? You mm. politicians have expected to, to have definite answers to things, and yeah. um, if they're sat in front of, I don't know, they, you'll have interviewers like we have in the in the UK, and they can't tell you exactly how many people are going to die of COVID in the next two weeks, then they're regarded as not worthy to not mm. worthy to sit in Parliament. Hmm. Hmm. Cool. Well, we might um, might call it there unless um, anybody has one last question. Going, going, gone. Okay, good. Okay. <laughs> um, thanks very much, Mike, on behalf of Ali, David, and Mikhail, and uh, thanks for everybody to, for contributing as well tonight. It's been really great to have you, Mike. Uh, quite a for our little community, quite a feather in our cap, cap to have you along. Um, had some great speakers and, and you're definitely counted amongst them. So thank you very much for, for that. Um, thank you, Dave. Cool. Ali, Dad or Mikhail, anything to, left to say? I think Mikhail might have, might have left us but, and left the, left the recording running. <laughs> thank you so much, Dave and Mike and everyone. The, I Sorry, I was in transit and I could just join for the last half hour. But even this last half hour was very interesting, particularly with really great participants asking very good question and sharing their experience and thank you so much mike i recall everything Dave. oh yeah i, I let me um, let me um, say the same ali, ali dad the uh, great questions great participants and uh, happy to do it again in a few months um if you are because i've enjoyed it right we'll take you up on that mike with that no, we'll, uh, we'll stop the recording there and um if anyone wants to stay on the on the call i'm not sure if it um it pops off when we when the organizers go it probably does but please feel free to hang about thanks very much mike and everyone okay i'm going thank now you thank much. you very much cheers thanks a lot